I'd like to introduce you to an artist with whom I became acquainted with some years ago when I was representing his bronze wildlife sculpture at my gallery with great success. I soon discovered that there's a completely different dimension to Richard Southall's work, that of his contemporary figurative sculpture, which is extremely powerful and is as yet undiscovered. The game is the first installation of Richard's contemporary sculpture that I remember him showing me four or five years ago. Before this, I was only familiar with his finely crafted bronze leopards, rhinos and wildlife sculptures. This piece, with the two polar bears sat in their casual poses on wooden stools, comically engrossed in a game of chess, really struck me as an incredibly powerful piece of work. The current serious situation with the demise of our Arctic landscapes disappearing into the oceans is brought to the forefront of this initially humorous installation. The polar bears contemplate their next move, the next piece to be taken from the board. In December 2007, I had this piece on show in an empty shop front near my gallery in Bristol. With the bears measuring some five feet in height, they filled the window. I took great delight in looking down the road at the scene of crowds of people huddled around the window, all lit up in the early evenings of the winter, engrossed in the fantastic spectacle of the game. So Richard, can you tell me when you first started sculpting? I was partly brought up by uh, an old Victorian aunt who was bedridden and uh, she asked me to do this. Uh, I must have made a little fish made out of, uh, a, made out of shells and she stuck it onto uh, a piece of paper. And I've still got that and it's written on it. It's got Richard Southall, four and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And I can always remember um, when I was probably five, first going to school, I'd always model something, possibly a dinosaur out of plasticine before I even went to school and going to my dad's studio, like, and uh, that wasn't an artist studio, just his garage. My dad was always interested in museums, well, he wasn't interested in football, and uh, we, we, we'd always go out on a Saturday afternoon to Birmingham Museum. So I was exposed to their fantastic collection of pre-Raphaelites, and there's, there's the incredible Epstein's Lucifer in there, which is one of my favourite pieces. And I can always remember even at a really early age looking at a picture and having some sort of connection with it. And my dad would question me on this occasionally. And he'd see, he, he couldn't quite understand what I was talking about. Well, I was mentioning these feelings. And I don't quite know what they are now, but I've, I've always been able to tune into certain good art. And um, we, would, we would go caravans all over the country. and. Every town we went to, we would hit the museum or the local castle. My dad was a working class guy, but uh, he had that side to him. Um, an example, we were at the Edinburgh Festival. We, there are gardens along Princes Street. And I always remember a church there. And there was a painting, and it was on the floor, it hadn't been hung. And it was called The Black Christ. And it was the first time Christ had ever been portrayed as black. He was a pris possibly a prisoner of conscience. He painted the Roman soldiers as, as his guards. And later, that, that inspired me for a uh, prisoner of conscience. And what, why do you keep going? What drives you? What motivates you? It's fun. It's fun. Uh, so many artists nowadays uh, employ teams of people to e even life cast their work. So they're missing out on that. that sort of energy that exists, that interaction. To interact with a model brings you into the now, into the, the, the moment. It's a fantastic feeling. Sort of an energy, you can be working for about three hours and you, you think 10 minutes has gone past. And at the end of it, you, you're quite elevated. Where did you study and how was your study different? At school I was an absolute, complete, utter failure. Uh, not, not so much at primary school but at secondary school. I remember a kid in, in the playground once, I was about 14 or 15, that was the age you left school then, saying, um, oh, Southall's got 4% got in French. I thought, oh no, you know, I'm going to get it because the, they hit you in those days. And um, the, only thing, the only way forward I could go was to art college, so we, we turned up with my paintings at Warsaw Art College uh, with my mom and dad, and um, the head of the, the, the um, college 
took, went through all my pages, I'd look at them. And he said to all three of us, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Southall, uh, I have to tell you, your son has no artistic talent whatsoever. So I, I just, I believe that. My mom and dad believe that, and I gave up for about 15 years. I stopped drawing, painting. I still made things, mm. but I didn't consider that, that to be art. So I, I think a lot of what I've done as, as a younger person, I didn't put it in an, into an artistic category. And I, I, I was actually, I was rejected from art college when I left school. And why did you return to art and sculpting well, 20 years later? I was delivering cake, married with young children, delivering cakes in Wolverhampton at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and uh, I'd really had enough of that. And, and my, my ex-wife, who was quite an educated woman, sent me. She said, you better go and do what you're good at. So I turned up at art, at art college. I think it was a ceramic course. And they said, where's your work? And I said, well, I haven't got any. They said, come back in, in two months, you know, when the term starts. So I went away, we went to Stoke-on-Trent, where all the, they mined the, the clay, bought some clay back, and I started modelling. And I hadn't touched that for probably 15, 20 years, possibly even longer, because of, the, of the, in, the incident where my confidence had been destroyed, sort of thing. And uh, I found I, I, I could make things, mm. almost as if, as if I'd developed as well without actually doing anything, which is very, very strange. I, I took the work in and he saw it was, all, it was all figurative work. He said, you're no good for the ceramics course. Next door is uh, a very unconventional course being run by a chap called Stuart Osborne. Again, Osborne had very close associations with Epstein. He took me on straight away. I spent three years there. He was running a, possibly one of the only figurative courses in the country. And he said, um, the model's in there, um, I can't teach you anything, I'll see you in three years. <laughs> it was almost like Rodin's studio, and we were just submerged in, in, in figurative work. You didn't copy anybody else's style, you, you were just influenced by the, their, their life story. Rodin, Epstein, all the greats. I, I just, you know, it, it was made for me. Have you had any criticism about um, your work, your figurative work, being overly academic or overly technical? I've always loved animals. I think I've loved nature. Mm. And again, from probably from a very, very early age. Uh, yes, I do, I, I do study the anatomy. Many years ago, as I was invited down to Kent Institute of Art and Design, I think they called it CIAD, to give a lecture on my figurative work. And what I didn't realise was that uh, the lecturer could um, sort of humiliate me in a way because if they considered um, figurative work to be absolutely ridiculous at that time. There were about 200 people in there. And as soon as, I, as soon as the first slide came on, the figurative piece of work, the audience started walking out and there were two big double doors and they were going boom, 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 boom. And I thought, the show has to go on. Like they're, they're throwing rock cabbages at me, sort of thing. So earlier on, uh, when I was putting the slides into the, into the carriage, and the, uh, the powers that be there tried to stop me and said, don't show any of your contemporary work. So that they're walking out for the first 20 minutes of the lecture. But I showed a, a rabbit in the deck chair. There was a big, ah, oh, went up. And everybody stopped walking out. The whole, the whole atmosphere of the thing changed. And there was a big argument. And I always remember saying, um, why did Jacqueline Dupre uh, play the, the, the Elgar's cello concerto? I mean, it's old hat, it's been done. But she's took something from the past and put an energy into it that is now considered just phenomenal. And I think a famous musician once said, I think it may, may have been Miles Davis, um, um, you, need, you need to know the rules to break them. Last summer, Richard rang me up and told me that he had a surprise for me, his latest work, Sobeg. He didn't tell me too much about it at first, just that it was inspired by an ancient stone carving at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford of an Egyptian god who bore the head of an alligator upon his human body. 
Seen in the flesh, the modelling was brilliant. The cool, nonchalant page is spot on. This piece is so lifelike that I expected him to uncross his leg and get up at any moment. Sobek, along with the rest of the Egyptian series, has not left Richard's studio. Seeing his life-size work in the ancient old barn has given me a wonderful sense of discovery. What is your most recent work based on Egyptian gods and goddesses? My daughter lived, lived in Egypt, in the Sinai, for a period, on the edge of the desert, and I used to go out and visit her. And I got to really, really like the Bedouin people. Earlier this year, I went down the Nile for the first time, and when I came back, I just, I just wasn't right. I just, um, it, it just blew my mind. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Uh, there were temples such as Edfu, which I'd never heard of in my life, which was an almost, com it's an almost a complete temple. It's, it's the most intact temple, and the, the paint is still on the walls. And it's 3,250 years old. And it was old when Cleopatra visited her father built it. And the concept of that is just mind-blowing, and their level of art is just phenomenal. But this, this gentleman here, Sobek, um, his head came from the, uh, I, I was visiting the Ashmolean Museum. Completely phenomenal piece, beautiful piece of carving, and I was just glued to it in the, in the museum. The leopard-headed goddess and the serpent are also of Richard's Egyptian series. The heads cast in bronze resin are somehow brought to real life by their clothes. The serpent, standing at well over six feet, unnerved me with her glass eyes. Her dress, rigid with paint, had the appearance of being brought out of the water, a lake perhaps. You've been invited to uh, create some quite prominent commissions. Uh, which you've turned down. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Why have you turned those down? My heart wouldn't be in it. I would literally produce a load of rubbish if somebody else wanted me to model something that wasn't of interest to me. The, uh, whether it be a portrait head or, or an animal, I have to have that love for the animal to, to create the piece, the interest. And commissions are so, so time-consuming and boring, quite honestly. Mm. I, I, I don't think I can handle boring art. It's, it's got to be of interest to me. It's got to fire me. It's got to, uh, both intellectually and, and physically, I've, I've got to be into it. The Rabbit, the Rat and the Tarantula. Another incredible creation from Richard's imagination, inspired from when he found the large stuffed tarantula in a junk shop and found a new use for it, a new life for it. I asked Richard what was the meaning of this piece. Richard was reluctant to explain it to me. He just said, it's an obvious story, no need to explain it. I'm still left curious, but it's an engaging piece. Richard, can you tell me a bit more about the piece called The Rabbit, the Rat and the Tarantula and where the inspiration came for that piece? I've become aware of the, uh, the white rabbit as being uh, a mythological symbol. I was a primary school teacher for quite a long time, a number of years. I think I was influenced regarding the rabbit, um, regarding children's literature. The uh, children's books are ph phenomenally illustrated, they're brilliant artists. And I think it was necessity is the mother of invention. And I, I was sitting there with a the class of kids looking at the pictures and I thought, I, th I think I'll make a seven foot white rabbit by the, uh, by the side of the River Luga. Uh, so so I, I did a bit of a Banksy there, you know, and uh, people were coming from, from Kilmarnock, which was about 20 miles away, by word of mouth, to, to look at the white rabbit. The poachers took it on as their symbol. It used to glow on uh, moonlit nights, so I called it the Moon Rabbit. And incredibly, I found out that moon rabbits exist. I've recently been in Ramesses III's tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and I gave the uh, the, the guide. I tipped him too much. I didn't realise how much I tipped him. So he, he removed all the barriers. 
and allowed me to go into, into to the, the inner sanctuary where you can't go. And like I went up to this great sarcophagus that had been smashed open by tomb robbers with a big head on it, it's covered in dust. And above each corner of the, the, the inner sanctuary were white rabbits, which were almost identical to that, and they're called Un, U-N. So the white rabbit, without me realizing it, is an Egyptian god. But the rabbits are about over 20 years old. Mm. And I went, that experience took place a couple of months ago in January. I think these things are, they talk about the, I think Jung talked about the, the collective consciousness. And possibly something's going on there. It's, an, and particularly with children, children are aware of these images more than adults. Richard's contemporary installations have been largely unseen. They're surreal creations from an incredible imagination. Life-size creatures standing at five to six feet in height, they're often intimidating, curious, somehow humorous, all at the same time. Whether highlighting eco or environmental issues, or a modern interpretation of ancient Egyptian mythology, these works are powerful. Their strength comes through their structure being so real. It is clear that these were created by an artist who has a well-educated knowledge of human and animal anatomy. He may not have excelled at school, largely due to dyslexia, but this is his subject, achieved through hours and hours of endless drawing in life classes, museums, and on his travels around the world. Is this the, is this the finished um, product? Or? Yeah, I yeah, I think it is. Yeah. 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 And do you think it's important that these kept as a collection? I'd more like them to be seen than to go into private, private collections. I'd more like a museum to buy them that's going to show them to the public than I would hate him to disappear into a private collection and, and me never see him again. Because there's a relationship between us with, with him out of time, mm. um, modelling him sort of thing. Where, have you got any further ideas for developing pieces of this series? Well, um, Bastet, the cat-headed goddess, would be the next. And I've got something quite spectacular. So that's under wraps at the moment, but yeah, Bastet's next. What do you think is the future for your latest series, the Egyptian thoughts and goddesses? Have you, have you tried approaching galleries with this work yet? I'd like the public to see that very, very much at the moment I'm, uh, I'm, I'm writing a play as to say and uh, nobody's seeing it you know it's it's an interaction between the artist and the public and uh, we've, we've had a lot of the artists working here sort of uh, alone um, I, I think they need to be exhibiting art is a two-way two-way road you know you, you do it but there's an audience as well which, which doesn't exist at the moment. Nobody's seen any of these. When they, when they get out there, they're going to uh, be really pleased to be in a gallery. So sometimes I, I try to visualise them in a gallery, you know, sitting there, you know. Um, Rich, this is actually incredible and unique work, and I wish you the very best in having it discovered and promoted in the right possible way. Thank you. Thanks very much.